I'm going to start out with a piece, a prayer actually, written for a memorial for Audre Lorde, one of our finest. It's called Reconciliation. And it comes out of thinking about where we are at the end of the century and where we're going. Because we're all here together at a time of incredible possibility as well as incredible destruction. Reconciliation. One. We gather at the shore of all knowledge as peoples who were put here by a God who wanted relatives. This God was lonely for touch and imagined herself as a woman with children to suckle, to sing with, to continue the web of the terrifyingly beautiful cosmos of her womb. This God became a father who wished for others to walk beside him in the belly of creation. This God laughed and cried with us as a sister at the sweet tragedy of our predicament, foolish humans, or built a fire as our brother to keep us warm. This God who grew to love us became our lover, sharing tables of food enough for everyone in this whole world, too. O oh, sun, moon, stars, our other relatives, peering at us from the inside of God's house, walk with us as we climb into the next century, naked but for the stories we have of each other. Keep us from giving up in this land of nightmares, which is also the land of miracles. We sing our song, which we've been promised has no beginning or end. Three, all acts of kindness are lights in the war for justice. Four, we gather up these strands broken from the web of life. They shiver with our love as we call them the names of our relatives and carry them to our home made of the four directions and sing of the south where we were feasted and were given new clothes of the West, where we gave up the best of us as food for the battle, of the North, where we cried because we were forsaken by our dreams, of the East, because return to us is the spirit of all that we love. Thank you. And violence seems to be a prevalent theme in the history of this land. People are looking around saying, well, you know, where's this coming from? Well, you know, this country as we know it is built on violence, on the blood of our peoples. Native peoples in this country were 100% of the population, now we're one half of 1%. And um, I'm going to tell one story. Often, as I drive around this country or fly around this country to speak in different places, the people I come into contact with most often are taxi drivers. And I hear a lot of stories that way. And this next piece comes out of, out of one of those stories. I was in a downtown Chicago hotel room when I called home and was shocked by the story of an Albuquerque taxi driver who was stabbed in the neighborhood I had just moved from a few weeks before. The driver dragged himself to the porch of a home that may have been the house that had been a sweet harbor. He died there. I knew many of the taxi drivers because I often took a taxi to the airport. I fearfully imagined the faces and voices of all of them. I could smell this tragedy though I was far from home. I imagined being able to do something had I been there instead of Instead, I was throwing up as I imagined washing his blood off my porch, calling his relatives. Did he have daughters or sons? Who told his mother? How would they bury him? That morning, I took a taxi from the hotel to O'Hare with a taxi driver who introduced himself to me as Rami. I was still shaken with the story of the death of the Albuquerque taxi driver. I have no explanation for senseless acts of violence. The weight was pressing me. Rami and I began talking. 
As an Indian woman in this country, I often find I have much in common with many of the immigrants from other colonized lands who come here to make a living, often as taxi drivers. And he told me of his friend, another taxi driver, who was killed in similar circumstances as the Albuquerque driver. And this is called Letter from the End of the 20th Century. You have to imagine re little reggae with this. We play this with my band. I shared a half hour of my life this morning with Rami, an Igbo man from northern Nigeria who drove me in his taxi to the airport. Rami told of his friend who one morning around seven, a morning much like this one, was filling his taxi with gas. He was imagining home, a village whose memories had given him sustenance to study through his degree and would keep him going one more year until he had the money he needed to return. As the sun broke through the gray morning, he heard his mother tell him the way she had told him when he was a young boy, how the sun had once been an Igbo and returned every morning to visit relatives. These memories were the coat that kept him warm on the streets of ice. He was interrupted by a young man who asked him for money, a young man who was like so many he saw on his daily journey onto the street to collect fares. Oh, no, sorry, man. I don't have anything I can give you, he said, as he patted the pockets of his worn slacks, his thin nylon jacket. He saved every penny because he knew when he returned, he'd be taking care of a family, several houses large. He turned back to the attention of filling his gas tank. What a beautiful morning, almost warm, and the same sun, the same Igbo, looking down on him in the streets of the labyrinth, far, far from home. And just like that, he was gone, from a gunshot wound at the back of his head, the hit of a casual murderer. As we near the concrete plains of O'Hare, I imagine the spirit of Rami's friend at the door of his mother's house, the bag of dreams in his hands dripping with blood. His mother's tears make a river of red stars to an empty moon. The whole village mourns with her. The ritual of tears and drums summon the ancestors who carry his spirit into the next world. There. He can still hear the drums of his relatives as they accompany him on his journey. He must settle the story of his murder before joining his ancestors, or he will come back a ghost. The smallest talking drum is an insistent heart, leads his spirit to the killer, a young Jamaican immigrant who was traced to his apartment because his shirt of blood was found by the police thrown off in the alley with his driver's license in the pocket. He searches for his murderer in the bowels of Chicago and finds him shivering in a cramped jail cell. He could hang him or knife him, and it would be called suicide. It would be the easiest thing. But his mother's grief moves his heart. He hears the prayers of the young man's mother, and there is always a choice, even after death. He gives the young man his favorite name and calls him his brother. The young killer is then no longer shamed, but filled with remorse and cries all the cries he has stored for a thousand years. He learns to love himself as he never could, because his enemy, who has every reason to destroy him, loves him. That's the story that follows me everywhere and won't let me sleep. From Tallahassee grounds to Chicago to my home near the Rio Grande, it sustains me through these tough distances. This next, this next piece is another story from the labyrinth. It's called Deer Dancer. And it comes from a story told me years ago when I was standing 
in an Indian bar in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And it was one of those nights that, one of those really cold, blizzardy nights that no one in their right mind would step outside in. But here in this little bar, the only place open in that city, this little band of stragglers, people looking for home, waiting, you know, waiting for morning, playing pool, playing the jukebox, when in walked the most beautiful woman in the world. And this is my version of what happened. <laughs> Dear Dancer, nearly everyone had left that bar in the middle of winter except the hardcore. It was the coldest night of the year. Every place shut down, but not us. Of course, we noticed when she came in. We were Indian ruins. She was the end of beauty. No one knew her, the stranger whose tribe we recognized, her family related to dear, if that's who she was, a people accustomed to hearing songs in pine trees and making them hearts. The woman inside the woman who is to dance naked in the bar of misfits blue, dear magic. Henry Jack, who could not survive a sober day, thought she was buffalo calf woman, come back, passed out, his head by the toilet. All night he dreamed a dream he couldn't say. The next day he borrowed money, went home, then sent back the money I lent. Now that's a miracle. <laughs> Some people see vision in a burned tortilla. Some in the face of a woman. This is the bar of broken survivors, the club of shotgun, knife wound of poison by culture. We who were taught not to stare drank our beer. The players gossiped down their cues. Someone put a quarter in the jukebox to relive despair. Richard's wife dove, see, Richard's wife dove to kill her. We had to hold her back, empty her pockets of knives and diaper pins, buy her two beers to keep her still, while Richard secretly bought the beauty a drink. How do I say it? In this language, there are no words for how the real world collapses. I could say it in my own, and the sacred mounds would come into focus, but I couldn't take it in this dingy envelope. So I look at the stars in this strange city, frozen to the back of the sky, the only promises that ever make sense. My brother-in-law hung out with white people, went to law school with a perfect record, then quit. He said, you can keep your laws, your words, and practice law on the street with his hands. He jimmied to the proverbial dream girl, the face of the moon, while the players racked a new game. He bragged to us, he told her magic words, and that's when she broke, became human. But we all heard his bar voice crack. What's a girl like you doing in a place like this? That's what I'd like to know. What are we doing in a place like this? You would know she could hear only what she wanted to, don't we all? Left the drink of betrayal, Richard bought her at the bar. What was she on? We all wanted some. Put a quarter in the juke. We all take risks stepping into thin air. Our ceremonies didn't predict this, or we expected more. I had to tell you this, for the baby inside the girl sealed up with a lick of hope and swimming in the praise of nations. This is not a rooming house, but a dream of winter falls and the deer who portrayed the relatives of strangers. The way back is deer breath on icy windows. The next dance, none of us predicted. She borrowed a chair for the stairway to heaven and stood on a table of names and danced in the room of children without shoes. You picked a fine time to leave me, Lucille, with four hungry children and a crop in the field. And then she took off her clothes. 
She shook loose memory, waltz with the empty lover we'd all become. She was the myth slipped down through dream time. The promise of feast we all knew was coming. The deer who crossed through knots of a curse to find us. She was no slouch, and neither were we watching. The music ended, and so does the story. I wasn't there. But I imagined her like this, not a stained red dress with tape on her heels, but the deer who entered our dream in white dawn, breathed mist into pine trees, her fawn a blessing of meat, the ancestors who never left. Thank you. And this next piece comes out of that same landscape and winter and darkness. I, once upon a time, I was a student at the Iowa Writers' Workshop <laughs> in the middle of Iowa. And in a way, that was one of the hardest times in my life because I came up against, I suppose, a major conflict that I think as a, a, a Native woman who is a Western writer, whatever that means, an American writer, comes up against when it hits, when it hits Puritanism. <laughs> Maybe that's. But I survived it, several of us survived it. And one day I was flying over it, looking down at the snow and remembering those 80 below wind chill factor days and thinking about how in the midst of all of it, every once in a while, there would be these moments when you least expected it, these moments of incredible, nearly unbearable grace. And this is about one of those moments. Grace. I think of wind and her wild ways the year we had nothing to lose and lost it anyway in the cursed country of the fox. We still talk about that winter, how the cold froze imaginary buffalo in the stuffed horizon of snowbanks. The haunting voices of the starved and mutilated broke fences crashed our thermostat dreams and we couldn't stand it one more time. So once again, we lost a winter in stubborn memory, walked through cheap apartment walls, skated through fields of ghosts into a town that never wanted us in the epic search for grace. Like coyote, like rabbit, we could not contain our terror and clowned our way through a season of false midnights. We had to swallow that town with laughter so it would go down easy as honey. And one morning, as the sun struggled to break ice and our dreams had found us with coffee and pancakes in a truck stop along Highway 80, we found grace. I could say grace was a woman with time on her hands or a white buffalo escaped from memory. But in that dingy light, it was a promise of balance. We once again understood the talk of animals, and spring was lean and hungry with the hope of children and corn. I would like to say, with grace, we picked ourselves up and walked into the spring thaw. We didn't. The next season was worse. You went home to Leech Lake to work for the tribe, and I went south and wind. I am still crazy. I know there is something larger than the memory of a dispossessed people. We have seen it. try this. I usually play with my band, not by myself. But uh, this next piece is a love poem. Actually, the next three are kind of. One is for a granddaughter. And um, this one takes place in Washington, D.C. And 
you know, Washington, D.C. is a very loaded, loaded symbol and place for Indian people in this country. So it was amazing to find this there. And the song I'm going to play is a traditional Lakota women's love song. hours we counted precious were blackbirds in the density of Washington. Taxis toured the labyrinth with passengers of mist as the myth of ancient love took the shape of two figures carrying the dawn tenderly on their shoulders to the shores of the Potomac. We fled the drama of lit marble in the capital for a refuge held up by sweet everlasting earth. The man from Ghana who wheeled our bags was lonesome for his homeland, but commerce made it necessary to carry someone else's burdens. The stars told me how to find us in this disorder of systems. Washington did not ever sleep that night in the sequence of eternal nights. There were whirring calculators, computers stealing names, while spirits of the disappeared drank coffee at an all-night cafe in the city of disturbed relativity. Justice is a story by heart in the beloved country where imagination weeps. The sacred mountains only appear to be asleep. When we finally found the room in the hall of mirrors, I could no longer bear the beauty of scarlet licked with yellow in the wings of blackbirds. This is the world in which we undress together. Within it, white deer intersect with the wisdom of the hunter of grace. Horses wheel toward the morning star. Memory was always more than paper and cannot be broken by violent history or stolen by thieves of childhood. We cannot be separated in the loop of mystery between blackbirds and the memory of blackbirds. And in the pre-dawn, when we had slept for centuries in a drenching sweet rain, you touched me, and the springs of clear water beneath my skin were new knowledge, and I loved you in the city of death. Through the darkness and the sheer rise of clipped green grass and asphalt, our ancestors appear together at the shoreline of the Potomac in their moccasins and press suits of discreet armor. They go to the water from the cars of smoky trains or dismount from horses dusty with fatigue. See the children who became our grandparents, the old women whose bones fertilize the corn. They form us in our sleep of exhaustion as we make our way through this world of skewed justice of songs without singers. I embrace these spirits of relatives who always return to the place of beauty, whatever the outcome in the spiral of power. And I particularly admire the tender construction of your spine, which in the gentle dawning is a ladder between the deep in which stars are perfectly stars and the heavens where we converse with eagles. And I am thankful to the brutal city for the space which outlines your limber beauty. To the man from Ghana who also loves the poetry of the stars. To the ancestors who do not forget us in the concrete and paper illusion. To the blackbirds who are exactly blackbirds. And to you, sweetheart, as we make our incredible journey.
Thank you.